Right, great. Okay, we are recording. Great, right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, let's start our meeting with our vision and charge. Minute, minute taker. Oh, uh, it should be Laura. I don't think she's here. Oh, she's just joining. Hey, Laura, can you be the minute taker this week? Sure. Thank you. All right, great. So, um, so our vision, again, is to work with the community in town to raise awareness and achieve results with a sense of urgency. Um, uh, last week, we were talking about planning and prioritizing cross-functional efforts and recommending programs, which we did. Thank you all for your feedback. Uh, I sent it over to Anna. Um, I was there at the meeting on Monday, but uh, I did not attend the part where they were talking about the town manager goals. I don't know if anybody did, uh, but if you did and you listen to it, we can talk about it during the uh, ECAC member updates. Uh, again, our sectors, we're still, uh, nothing's changed here, the five sectors that we have. And then in terms of uh, metrics. Stephanie, I added a new one based on the conversation that we were having about goals last week um, around the expense spend report and how that is being used um, to meet our sustainability goals. So I have that for as a quarterly action mm -hmm. for now, so we can make changes if needed. Um, we're having our third education series today. Super excited. So thanks, Lori, for setting this up again. Appreciate it. And then in terms of action items, Stephanie, again, all you here, um, I think we can remove the fourth one on this list. Yeah, I, I don't see why we'd need that one still. OK. What about the first two steps? Um, so we're still, that is, you know, the first two are still in process. Uh, Don and I met. Um, so we're sort of working it out and I think he's going to give you an update. So okay, um, I'm working with him. So. Okay. Just keep that as in process. Yes. Okay. All right. Let's uh, move on to the next part of the agenda then is to review our minutes. Any questions or comments about last week's minutes? I move we accept them as they are. Thanks, Lori. Andrew, we couldn't hear you. I second. Thank you. Okay, in no particular order via voice, voice vote, Goldner? Yes. D? Yes. Roof? Yes. Allison? Yes. Raghavan? Yes. Selman? Yes. Gregor? Yes. Rose? Yes. Drucker? Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, everybody. Let's open up to the public for comments. And we have Anna with us. Anna, I'm giving you the ability to talk, so feel free to unmute yourself. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Hey, Anna. Okay, um, so no other comments. All right, uh, so I know Stephanie, you wanted to talk about a time sensitive item. So should we move the agenda to address that first before we talk about progress reports? No, I think you can do the progress reports first. I just wanna be able to <clears throat> very quickly go over those questions and see if anyone has any um, edits or just encourage people to get edits to me, so. Okay. And, and Lori, how long is the meeting, um, the education series? I'm Sorry. assuming it'll be about an hour. I didn't actually ask, but I looked at the slides and it looks to me like it'll be less than an hour of presentation. And then he knows he knows he has an hour slot. So okay. I would assume it's going to be an hour. Okay. Um, I looked at this. I mean, the slides look like they're less than an hour. So he's leaving lots of time for questions, which sounds really good to me. Okay, thank you. Okay, if that's the case then, Don, if we can uh, talk about pace. Sure. Um, I, I think as Stephanie just told you, Stephanie and I 
um, met, I'm working with Stephanie. Um, I put together a very um, simple one page information sheet that hopefully will um, make available to individuals who are interested um, in doing any sort of renovations or retrofitting of commercial or multifamily properties. Um, I am technologically challenged. So Stephanie said she would um, screen share that. Um, so you can see. Sorry, That's busy. Right. paid no attention to my screen. You, you've got way too pay. much to do, Stephanie. Way... I, I cannot tell you how much IT gives me grief about that. So hold on and I'll get the proper screen I mean, that won't overwhelm you. Panic attack, Stephanie. <laughs> okay. Okay. So this is um, this is the very brief um, description of the program um, that I put together. Ran it by Stephanie. Um, I, I believe um, you know the issues going to be. You, you were going to send it maybe Stephanie to the finance uh, director here, um, yeah. but it, it just basically lays out the program. Um, it lays out I I left out in the type of improvements that are eligible for PACE financing, the gas line extensions. Um, since I'm not sure that is something that we want to encourage. So I, uh, I, I selected the two other areas other than gas line extensions, the energy consumption reduction improvements, which relate to energy efficiency and conservation measures like lighting, lighting control upgrades, HVAC equipment upgrades, building envelope, impro envelope improvements, efficient electrification, combining uh, combined heat and power, and then the renewable energy improvements, solar, solar voltaic panels, wind systems, solar thermal, ground source heat pumps, and air source heat pumps. Um, you know, I'm pretty clear in the beginning that it's only available to owners of existing properties um, and that it's designed to encourage and incentivize property owners to make energy efficient renovations or and or retrofits to their properties. Explain that it's jointly administered by the Department of Energy Resources, DOER, and Mass Development. Um, the mass development finance agency that um, ultimately issues the bonds, well, the state issues the bonds, but uh, with the approval of DOER, the bonds get issued for um, the financing, that the applications um, are made to mass development, they've got to be approved by DOER. Um, and interestingly, um, PACE, and, and it is, even though we call it CPACE, Massachusetts calls it Pace Massachusetts. Um, and Pace Massachusetts encourages program participants to leverage both mass save and mass CEC incentives in connection with the proposed project. I then give the um, website, uh, the mass development website that uh, people that are interested, developers or property owners that are interested can um, pull up the guidelines and the application. Um, Stephanie put the little question down there in the bottom, which I haven't had a chance to re respond to her yet. Do we want to include a local contact here as well? Would it be the finance director, Stephanie, or or Stephanie is director of sustainability or, or both? Um, I think the issues, one of the things that interests me as as we're talking about the um, some of the um, retrofitting programs, the heat pump programs, whether somehow or other we can look into, a, a, you know, somehow or other combining the availability of this financing. Now, I understand our heat pump programs, I, I believe, unless I'm wrong, are really geared toward individual property owners as opposed to group property owners and I may be wrong at, about that 
but I'm wondering if there's a dovetailing in here between the financing program that's available under Pace Massachusetts and whatever um, programs we as a town want to encourage uh, to, to do a, a number of the things that the financing in uh, uh, available under Pace Massachusetts lets be done. Um, the next issue is, and Stephanie, I talked about whether or not we could sponsor some sort of um, educational uh, uh, program for uh, major property owners. I mean, earmarked toward owners of large residential <laughs> um, properties um, with lots of units on them, um, or and or uh, commercial. Um, developers who might be interested in um, in renovating a existing commercial buildings um, and and what the, the next step might be to do that that kind of educational um, outreach um, obviously um, there's the chamber and I did talk to um, the executive director of the chamber um, and you know where do we take it from here you know, I have my own um, I, I have my own concerns, and I think I mentioned these to you all a while back. That um, you know, prop, property owners are are it's going to have to make financial sense for them to do um, any of the retrofitting um, or um, uh, renovating. Uh, and and essentially borrow the money to do it. It's it's going to have to make economic sense. And and how we go about convincing them um, that there is a economic value in re regardless of dollars saved, that there's an economic value in um, in a community wide effort to uh, uh, to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, I don't know, um, but I'd welcome any thoughts on that. Those of you who are persuasive uh, in, in that area. I'm talking to you, Andrea. Don't see a raised hand. Well, I can I can say if there right. a comment, I can comment on one thing, which is that I think regarding your last point, um, we have to find a way to identify homeowner um, property owners who are going to make upgrades anyway, right? Because that's who need to replace a boiler or you know, who need to do something because it's at the end of its life. Um, they're gonna be spending money anyway. And if anything, it'll cost them less to do it this way, right? It'll cost them less both in the short term because of the incentives and rebates as well as the financing, uh, good financing terms. Um, and it'll cost them less in the long run, assuming they're moving from oil or propane heat. Um, so, I, I mean, I think that's the thing is to find property owners that whose buildings are ready for an upgrade anyway. And I don't know how we identify them. I don't know how we find them, but I think that's what we need to be doing. We need to be finding those folks. Can't find my raised hand feature. Um, can I stop sharing this document? Are folks okay sure. with that? Yeah. Okay. Um, just so we can see each other. Um, and sorry to jump in. I just couldn't see everybody. Um, I was just thinking about that as you were talking, Lori. That um, it seems to me that having the flyer and having it available here, where people have to come in for permitting, you know, they if they're going to do any of this work, they have to obtain permits. So having the information readily available and handed to them. Um, when they're considering this. Um, unfortunately, I think sometimes when people come in for the permitting, they might be that much farther ahead. So I don't know how much faster we can get it to them, but I feel like at least that feels like a point of contact that um, would be useful to make sure that when people are here, they're either right at the counter when people come in or we have them at the website or people automatically get them sent. Laurie, I think you have a 
response to that. So I'll let you go. Yeah, I think I think Dwayne has his hand up too, but I just thought of something else. But like, let Dwayne go first. You go, go ahead if, if you have if you have a continuation of your thought. That's fine. Well, of both thoughts, um, it just occurred to me that uh, we could probably get the renters involved in the following way: Are there particular properties that generate lots of complaints that we know are in trouble for various reasons, and can we approach those landowners? Right. Um, just a thought. <laughs> Dwayne and Jesse. Yeah, okay, yeah, I had uh, maybe a, a similar thought, but maybe less um, targeted than than um, Lori. But I just, I, I'm just sort of wondering. I mean, it, we have it's a relatively small town, especially if you take the universities away and colleges. I'm, I'm just wondering, you know, how many of these PACE eligible entities are there out there, um, and does the town have any access to email lists or mailing lists that that would cover a, a good number of them at least uh, or maybe the chamber itself because uh, i do think you know once they're pulling a permit they probably have a contractor they're they sort of know what they're doing and it may be a little bit late for them to switch gears um and just to make sure they all know this um maybe it'll trigger oh maybe this is a good time to do it or maybe it's something that they'll remember, you know, two years from now when they do need to replace something. So I guess I am wondering whether there's just a way to get, once we have a final flyer information, uh, is there just a way at, at not too much cost to get this out to um, the PACE eligible entities we have in town? Um, and then I was also thinking in terms of the um, financials, I mean, the, if these are commercial property owners, they probably have some financial sophistication, uh, you know, uh, more so than than um, a homeowner. Uh, so, you know, in terms of, of uh, them understanding the cash flow and payback period or rate of return, yep. um, I think they should, they, they should have the wherewithal to do that. And it's going to be very site specific. Um, you know, I do, you know, once you sort of talk about, okay, I'm going to upgrade my boiler to a heat pump, um, then, you know, it, it does sort of raising questions about the heat distribution in the building and whether you have to redo uh, some of the uh, air exchange uh, uh, handling units or radiation units it's, if it's a ground source heat pump. So there could be some additional um, expenses, um, but, um, uh, you know, may, maybe, well, maybe maybe another example is, is in a, uh, if we put together a flyer, but then maybe a, a, a couple sample um uh um pro formas i guess or or what this kind of mean might mean for a typical replacement of a um, oil boiler with a heat pump system or something along those lines uh and work out some sort of pro forma financial cash flow analysis that that would trigger their um thinking on this thanks Wayne. jesse and then andrew All right, a couple of quick suggestions. One, I, just to remember from the presentation we saw, there was a kind of threshold, an unofficial, not to be shared threshold of cost that if I recall is around $200,000, which was where she thought the project started to make economic sense. And that's probably a project that's gonna involve design professionals at that point. So getting this information out to that community I think is a good one. And then <clears throat> one way that people engage the town is they might call and say, hey, do I need a building permit to do X, Y, or Z? So if if we had a, if we could train the, the town staff or enable them to say, hey, glad you called. Can I email you a flyer with our latest incentives? The other place is if if you're researching a project, I want to do a project in Amherst, I go to the inspection services webpage. Is there any reason why there couldn't be a banner on every single sheet page for inspection services, regulations, fee schedules, documents, resources at the top of every single page? If you are replacing a boiler, click here and just take people to those resources. I think the web 
if it's okay, I just wanted to respond to that really quickly that, you know, the web presence is probably an easier route to go for sure. I, I don't think mm -hmm. that would be really challenging. It's just catching people. So um, I think to really make it happen, we're going to have to recruit. Um, we need to have someone in town who's forward thinking, be a demonstration, get press, um, you know, have them talk to the chamber. It's going to be a campaign. This isn't going to happen otherwise. This is why um, PACE hasn't taken off because um, it really it is a, a, a mindset change that we have to help and um, encourage. And um, so there's no one way to communicate. We, we, we're gonna have to really think about how many different ways we can communicate it. And of course, the best way is always one-to-one -one with you know the people we know in the community who own commercial buildings. That's the best way to actually find someone willing to listen and learn more. That's such yeah. a great idea, Andra. I really, yeah, find someone who wants to do it, make a case study, shine a light on it. That is brilliant. I have one last idea. Um, maybe, uh, maybe for one of our, oh, sorry, Laura, you, did you have your hand up? Yeah, but you can go ahead, Lori. I'll go next. Okay. Um, maybe for the next education series, even before we do a panel, we could have one of the, oh, we already sort of did this, didn't we? But maybe we can have a, it'd be interesting to hear from somebody who's actually done this, right, in another town. There are plenty of examples in other towns. Maybe we could get somebody through the building electrification guys who has done this, who would be willing to speak to specifically to Amherst, Builders, contractors, designers, or anyone in the area who is, you know, thinking of making use of this program. Yeah, and we did that with Greenfield, right, Stephanie? We somebody? Yes, we did. Yeah, yeah, we did yeah. that. We yeah. had that. We had the Greenfield one. So, yeah. did we get who who showed up to that though? Did we have builders and contractors in the audience? I don't recall. No, I don't it was. Know. Yeah, no, nothing. Yeah. We didn't even have a flyer at the time, Lori. Yeah. So, how do we get those guys? Yeah. They're Laura? not always easy to get to come. Sorry. Oh, yeah. So yeah, um, I think we've got some good ideas. We've got some ideas that we can do immediately and we should just go ahead and do those. I feel like these conversations always end with us saying we need to do a big campaign and that's always really too much for us to take on and we never do it and then we never do any of the things. So I think there's like a few things that we talked about that seem very simple speaking to communications department about whether we can get this first of all getting the flyer finalized getting on the website linking to it from all the pages we need to link to having it available in town hall next to the permitting office sending it out to the chamber to email folks so let's start with those things that seem like all things we could accomplish in a month or something and then go from there and see where we can go. Because once we have all that information up, then if we plan a campaign or some other event, like we have some place to send people. Yeah, and I agree. And you know, I was also going to say, Stephanie, if I may go, um, I, I think they're all good comments. I, I, I kind of echo what Andra said, uh, but in a not more elaborate fashion. Um, I think there should be boots on the ground. Um, Don, you know people in the community. Let's ask them what they're looking for um, and why would they convert? What would be the reason why they would convert into a greener initiative? I think that having that conversation will help us understand whether there's a need to have an education series, whether there's a need to put up links that we would need to do more work on. So I, I think I would say, let's have conversations with people uh, you know, I think Dwayne brought up, it's a small community. We should have emails and data about these property owners. Let's start having conversations with them and then figure out 
what actions we need to launch, whether it's updating the website or something else or through education series, we wouldn't know until we have that discussion. Uh, Stephanie and then Don. Um, so Don and I spoke about what a next step could be. And in working with the chamber in the bid, they have um, breakfasts and they have regular events where they gather the business community. So it'd be very easy to reach out to them and say, we would like to have this as a topic at one of your meetings. I've, that's one of the things that I actually did reach out to the finance director about was to A, look at the flyer and then B, to ask him if he would be interested and available to maybe do one of these with Don, who has experience. Um, and to be able to talk to folks and we can, you know, we could certainly work out what that might look like even more as if that idea moves forward, but it's certainly an opportunity where you already have a captive audience pretty much. Don, you were going to say something? Stephanie took care of what I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> so yes, he care of the whole thing. So would the, then would the flyer have language like um do you want to be a part of the our you know the first pace project in amherst like and if yes you reach out to don or stephanie or how is there a way to do what what laura's saying of like let's get the things done that we can get done now which i makes sense but also sort of cast a line out for for this bigger project and is that is it is that putting the cart before the horse to have this flyer this banner this sort of outreach piece make that ask those are just general it's just general information just literally get the information out that the program exists and the more people hear of it or see it then when you have an event and you say oh we're going to have this event where we're going to actually talk more about this and how you could get involved in this people will hopefully have seen or heard about it and that this will be just like another another reference to it. I think like with anything else, you just have to keep, you just have to keep getting the information out there. So I, I don't think you wanna start honing in and asking people, are you gonna be the first project? I think you just need to get people the information and let them know that, you know, this is how you can do it, that it's possible. Other communities have done it. Um, we can certainly use Greenfield as reference. I don't think Carol could come, but she could certainly, you know, their project is out there. Um, we could certainly reach out to the PACE program and even see if we can get someone from the PACE program to come, um, mm -hmm. you know, or another so, so community. So, Stephanie, you're saying let's have a conversation through whatever event that BID has at whatever frequency mm -hmm. to understand pain points, interest levels before we go and do anything. To basically just well, not before we do anything. No. I think you have to get the flyer out. You've got to get the information yeah, yeah. No, online. The flyer. And right. the program, that program would really just be again to give more information, but it gives people an opportunity to ask specific questions yeah. and to mm -hmm. be in the room together. And I think that kind of um, conversation and question and answer helps because sometimes someone will think of a question that somebody else wouldn't have and the response actually might actually trigger them to think that yeah. something they could do. So, and having, you know, having an example of uh, a community that's done something that might be willing to come might help too, because it'll be like, here is an actual example of something that was successful. Maybe Carol doesn't come, but maybe the folks who actually own that building or did that actual renovation might be willing to come. And, and Stephanie, how often do these meetings happen? Uh, I I think they used to happen monthly. And Don, I'm you're probably more connected to it than I am. Yeah, I'll I'll check. Um, um, I'll check with the uh, executive director of um, who I who I spoke to just a couple of weeks ago, and find out you know when how often they are, and when the next kind of breakfast kind of meeting is. I, I would also, you know. It, it, it is about getting the information out there because as I look at it as a lawyer, the the real, I, I think the best shot you have to get a project going is to find a property owner, whether it's a commercial property owner or an owner of a, of a large um, residential uh, rental property uh, project or, or property. Find somebody who's in the process of selling or buying that particular 
property where whoever's buying it is going to be looking toward renovating it or or doing something anyway. Um, and and if you get that information to them at that point, when you know there's going to be a sale, I think that's an easier point than to, you know, take somebody who has a property and try to convince them, hey, you ought to, you ought to retrofit this property and you ought to go out and spend the money to do it. Um, you know, it's really got to be what some of you have already said, like you, Laurie, that they're ready to replace, they're ready to replace all the boilers in you know, one of one of these properties or in a it, 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 one of these residential multifamily residential properties or in a commercial property. And this is a financing program that's available um, and that encourages um, the renewable energy and the non, you know, carbon footprint stuff. So. So getting into um, realtors. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you if there's a you know, if there's a big commercial deal being made to sell a piece of commercial property or, you know, it wasn't all that long ago that Rolling Ridge or whatever it is that's over there by, um, you know, by Echo Hill, you, you know, sold. And all the renovation that went into that at the time that the new buyer bought it, if you're able to get in front of that when, when another one of these things sells, you might actually be able to convince them that this is a great time to take advantage of a program like this because you're going to be doing these renovations anyway. Um, the, the, to me, those are real tipping points because the new buyer is going to do work, is going to do significant work on the building that they're buying, especially if it's an older building. Laura? Yeah, so I'm going to take... Um opportunity as the note taker here to maybe wrap up this convo and make sure I've jotted down the immediate action item. So what I've heard as immediate action items is that Don will reach out to the chamber to find out when the chamber meetings are happening next. Yeah. Stephanie is going to get feedback from Sean and who, and I think committee members should provide feedback on the flyer. Do we have a date by which we want to do that and who is going to be responsible for finance for finalizing the flyer. Don and I will work on that seeing that we were the ones working on it. Yeah. Okay. And, and it, it, yeah. It, it, I don't mind sending it out. I mean, we just screen shared it. We can send it out to you. And if there's any suggestions, I, I, I want to keep it short. I don't want something that's many pages long because you'll put people to sleep um, if it is. I just did send it to everybody just before the meeting, oh, by the way. Good. Okay. Okay. So an action would be to give Don and Stephanie feedback before our yep. next meeting and then finalize that. Um, okay. And then Stephanie, once we do that, Stephanie will share with folks in town. And then I think we can reconvene on others we want to reach out to and who will do it. Um, and the ideas that have been thrown around so far have been design firms, commercial realtors, re and HVAC companies, but we can talk more about that next time, as well as plan for additional campaigns. Yeah, we might have to do things in parallel as we're having conversations with the bid. Uh, if there are new owners that we can connect with, Don, not naming names, but you know, there's interest within our committee. Um, so just reach out to whoever you think can help you. Uh, this is a big initiative. So thank you. Jesse. There are some, there are some lawyers that do, you know, I mean, there, there are one or two law firms. In fact, very few law firms that actually do all of the permitting for these big deals going into town hall. And yeah, you can reach out to them too. Um, as they have a client that comes in that wants to buy a piece of property, um, and going to rehab it and needs to finance the rehabbing. It's there's a lot of possibilities, but I'm mindful of Laura saying we've talked about this enough. So <laughs> yeah, Jesse, final comments, and then we need to move on to the next topic. Just real quick, as you review the language, just consider thinking in all of our heads like this should be a replicable process. There's more incentives, more programs. There should be a. I think thematically, this is this should be a kind of fill in the blank type of brochure where any type of 
So the next time something comes up that we want to promote, this is just insert the right words and times and places. And it's the same thing over and over again, because this hopefully won't be the last. So just something to think about as, as you're reviewing the, the, the flyer. Thanks, Jesse. All right, we'll move on to our next topic on solar. So Dwayne, Dwayne are you going to go through the calculations at this meeting uh, um, now? Sorry, what was that again? Are you going to also go through the calculations now? I'm prepared to show you the spreadsheet that I have put together um, for discussion and comment. It's not final. Um, uh, I don't necessarily think it's ready for public consumption, but if we need to share it because we share it here, that's fine. Okay. Um, but uh, but yeah, and and I, and I don't think we, uh, you know, I, I certainly encourage people to. Um, dwell on it, think about it, and, and, and provide comments uh, over the next, uh, until the next meeting, and then I can try to wrap things up. Uh, but yeah, yeah, I can show you. And if we can take the next 18 minutes to discuss updates, because we'll leave the last six minutes for Stephanie to go over the time-sensitive material, and then we'll switch to the uh, education series. So, Bob, so I just wanted to um, remind you that uh, Anna's here and um, may not be able to stay the whole time. Okay. Um, Anna, any updates uh, if you want to jump into, or if you can wait, hold off until 528 or so? Um, I, I do have to jump. I'm sorry. I teach a class at 530, but um, really, really quickly, we did not do the goals on Monday. So we um, have added a new meeting on the 12th, this next Monday. So um, another three in a row, which is great. But um, it was a little sarcastic. Uh, so we'll be discussing it then. I have sent a redlined draft of the goals to back to um, the folks who are working on them in GOL that incorporated the, um, the ones you sent. There were a lot in there. Um, and so what I did do is I, I took the liberty of taking the ones that were policy related out of the town manager goals and they would go into the, the policy goal um, because those, are, those would be dealt with by the council. Um, and then there are a couple that were financial implications that I'm going to send to the finance committee to include in that or to see if they might include them in their um, financial guidelines document, which again is, is very broad and does not get into specificity, but we'll, um, we'll keep pushing for that. So just so you know, that discussion did not happen on Monday. You did not miss it. It will be happening Monday the 12th. Okay. And can you send me the draft that you were sending out to everybody, Anna, please? Sure, absolutely. Yep. And it, it again, like it's not a it's not a sure thing. So um yep. always, you know, keep, in, keep that in mind, but we'll we'll definitely keep trying. And yes, I will forward that to you. And if I haven't done it tomorrow by tomorrow, please, please feel free to remind me. We'll do. Thank you. Thank you. Uh Duane, you have about 16 minutes, if that's okay. Yep, I can just run through it quickly what I have, and then uh we can talk about how to uh it, it just high level comments and then how to get more specific comments but okay if i share the screen good okay so um let, let's just and sort of um understand the purpose of this um which is not really to look at in uh uh, uh in isolation but it goes hand in hand with the solar assessment work that is going on uh, for the town to look at um, the extent of the town and what the potential um, technical potential and then some preferential potentials of um, solar siting would be on land and on the built environment in in uh, within the jurisdictions of Amherst. Um, and um, what we wanted to be able to then do with that technical assessment is put into some context with regard to um, if if the town of Amherst was to host a certain amount of, of solar capacity within the town, what what that what might that look like uh, both on the built environment and the unbuilt environment? Uh, and to do that, we needed to have some basis to um, suggest, uh, some capacities that would be reasonable to expect um, uh, or want or propose um, for Amherst to host within its jurisdictions. And so that's the purpose of this um, evaluation. 
Uh, and the way we were looking at it is to look at it's for coming up with a range of solar hosting uh, or solar capacity that would would uh, seemingly be appropriate for Amherst um, and uh, and look at those different methodologies and look at the range of capacity levels that they would suggest uh, and then to use that to then uh, potentially um, come up as as ECAC uh, but others could come up with their own numbers um, to suggest that we look at in terms of potentially maybe a low and high uh, um, capacity amount that we would want to um, potentially host in Amherst and then what that would look like uh, in the um, solar assessment mapping that is concurrently taking place. Um, so that's what we set off to do. Um, and uh, um, so on this screen is spreadsheet to sort of put this into uh, into into some numbers. And there are three methods I think we discussed uh, a few meetings ago. Uh, so I'll just walk through these quickly and sort of um, how we I put this together. Um, I do appreciate um, some input from Steve on this as well and acknowledge that. Um, uh, there's some color coding here in terms of what are sort of user inputs or things we decide, what's just sort of calculated cells, uh, what are some fixed inputs that don't we don't really have flexibility on, and then the greens greens are really the outcomes uh, that we were are looking for under these methodologies. And in each case, in each method, I've tried to come up with a uh, a um, high a low and a high valued scenario uh, that would sort of scan uh, a reasonable um, uh, assumptions. Uh, so the method one is um, really looking to base a uh, capacity amount of solar in Amherst uh, that's uh, targeted in some way to the electricity that we consume in Amherst. Um, uh, and so we do have reasonably good electricity consumption across the whole town from the uh, uh, 2017, I think it was, uh, the last greenhouse gas inventory, excluding the universities and the colleges. All of this excludes the universities and colleges. And that's about 95,000 um, megawatt hours. Um, now, and this is also, I should point out, looking to be sort of um, uh, in line with the state, looking at sort of hosting what would make sense for hosting uh, by 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 2050, not tomorrow, but out out by 2050 timeframe. Um, uh, our current load is is pretty fixed, but pretty well known at 95,000 megawatt hours, um, residential, commercial, and so forth. Um, as per the 2050 roadmap, our electricity statewide is, uh, use is supposed to double, potentially a bit more than double. Uh, assuming Amherst does the same, um, I look at either a little bit less than doubling, 80%, or a little bit more than doubling, 120% as two options. Um, it doesn't mean that we need to uh, produce um, all, all of our renewable energy, assuming we're, we're going to get to 100% renewable energy by 2050. It doesn't mean that we have to produce it all from solar in Amherst. Uh, but um, assuming uh, I went with two assumptions, a low and a high here, um, noting that this, at the state level, it's expected that the solar contribution amongst all the renewables is about 25, 35%, the rest coming from offshore wind and hydro. I figured to some extent, so 25% was sort of a, a low scenario. I went with 50% thinking that um, you know, we're, we're uh, for, for those that think we're, we're, we're pretty far away from offshore wind, uh, we're pretty far away from hydro. If we wanted to uh, take that on, uh, take more of our local resources uh, and base our own consumption on local resources, the other, the highest scenario I, I chose, uh, but open for discussion uh, for ECAC and then others can use their, their own assumptions, but I went with 50%. That basically leads to, um, a range of capacity, solar capacity of 33 to 92 megawatts, a pretty large range, but these are all pretty wide ranges. The second methodology um, was to base it off of um, uh, of uh, the, the um, projections that the uh, statewide projections that the state is has recently come out with, with their 
2050 roadmap. Um, the state projects by 2050 um, a build out of about uh, between 25,000 and 35,000 megawatts, 25 to 35 gigawatts of, of solar as the contribution by 2050. I use that as the low and high value. Again, that's in the base case scenario. If, if uh, hydro doesn't come in, for example, or offshore wind comes in less, the expectation is that solar would have to be sub actually substantially higher. Uh, but as the, as the base case um, and the reference case, it's 25 to 35 megawatts. Um, I looked at, there's two potential two ways to look at that in terms of our fair share, if you want to look at it that way. Um, Amherst is about 0.289% of the land mass uh, within the Commonwealth. We're also about 0.559% of the population. Um, I did want to dig in a little bit more in terms of what that data that I used meant with regard to population, because I don't know if that's year-round popu uh, year population or, or how that treats students. Uh, Amherst is a little bit of an outlier when it comes to population demographics, I think. So I wanted to dig a little bit more into that, but that's the data that I had available. And so then, you know, one can look at that and say, okay, our land, we're, you know, these are the, our sort of fair share based on land and population. Uh, so, you know, I said as a, as a, as a, um, as a, as a assumption for, for low amount, if we wanted to get, take um, a quarter of a percent of the state capacity as a high percent, 0.6% of the state capacity kind of spanning the, the range of uh, our share of the land mass and the population. That led to uh, solar capacities between 63 and 210 megawatts. And then the final method that we talked about was um, building off of the 2050 roadmap um, and particularly the, um, the um, technical report on, on, uh, on, 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 uh, land issues, I forget the, the exact title of that, um, uh, was a um, uh, some, some as, uh, assumptions or projections that for ground-mounted solar, this is not the totality of solar, but for land ground-mounted solar, um, the uh, energy pathways scenarios covered a range of anywhere from 31,000 acres to 158,000 acres. With a mean of uh, of sixty thousand ac acres um, under the reference scenario, was projected um, to be needed at, for ground mounted solar in Massachusetts. Um, again, using uh, so I built a scenario off of that, um, and I kind of scan spanned that those uh, those uh, um, ranges uh, for a low value of thirty. 35,000, a high value of 100,000 acres. Um, and uh, again, then looking at mass, uh, Amherst's portion of that land mass. Um, and then also thinking about, you know, there's different thoughts and projections about how tightly you can uh, uh, pack solar on an acre of land. Uh, if, if, if we look at dual use solar uh, or parking lot, they tend to be a little bit less megawatts per acre. So there's some range there in terms of the density of, of uh, solar per acre. Um, and um, and then, you know, keeping in mind, this is just the ground mounted amount that Massachusetts needs, not the full amount. I made some further um, assess, assumptions, assumptions and to sort of build that up of the totality of solar, um, thinking that um, uh, anywhere from 40 to 60 percent of the solar um, and the, these are these I will admit are kind of made up numbers. I, I don't really have citations for that. The rest of the stuff I'm, I we are have fairly well referenced. Uh, though I one thing I want to complete in this uh, spreadsheet is just to have those citations clearly available for folks. Um, but in any case, this scenario sort of gave a a, a range of 24 to 180 megawatts. Um, I'll pause in a moment, but we then talked about looking at this graphically. Uh, so here's our three scenarios with the ranges of uh, solar capacity that sort of emanate uh, 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 from those different methods. Um, 
And the idea would then be to say, you know, not with precision, uh, but then to, you know, base, okay, we want a low, medium, and high uh, value perhaps to look at to see how it translates to the mapping uh, and the resource potential, solar potential in Amherst. Uh, and so we could use this type of um, graph to then pick out, okay, what's what's a reasonable low value, medium value, and high value that sort of sp uh, spans the um, um, the totality of the of the uh, capacities suggested by the three different methodologies. Um, the last spreadsheet is just some additional um, uh, data and, and assumptions that were made. Uh, but let me, um, I'm interested in folks' uh, thoughts on this um, and how you would like to um, dig into this further and, and uh, um, help, help, you know, I want this to be a, uh, something that we can all somewhat reach uh, consensus on both in the methodology of the assumptions and then how we select sort of so low, medium, high scenarios to look at in concert with the mapping. So yes, this is great, Dwayne, fantastic. Um, I mean, thanks Steve also for the support. Um, I'll let Jesse go first. Dwayne, do you think it would be appropriate if, if someone said, asked, hey, how much solar should Amherst have based on this presentation? And if I wanted to keep it very high level and simple, could I say, yeah, somewhere between 50 and 200 megawatts installed? Is that, could that be like a very, very concise, that's where we're headed kind of statement without getting into the weeds? Is that, would that, or that, is that crazy? Um, I, I'd say we want to discuss that um, because, um, um, and what our, what it, what is ECAC's role here, uh, and 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 what what do we want to put forward from the committee? Uh, uh, we've clearly heard some public comments with regard to this notion of fair share may not be the appropriate way to look at it. Um, uh, there may be arguments that Amherst is a special place. Um, and that it, we should look at this more regionally, uh, and maybe there are other areas that are better suited for solar than Amherst. Um, I don't. I think folks can push back on that. I think every place probably considers themselves fairly special, uh, and um, uh, and uh, obviously we we want to and and um, Western Massachusetts is pretty. Um, you know, there's there, there's there's farms and forests uh, and and the built environment. There's um, <laughs> I'm not sure there's a whole lot else. Um, and so um, I I think we want to be careful with regard to how to couch that um, and express that um, uh, uh, whether we want to sort of put out something as a as a proposal of what we what ECAC thinks we should host or. Uh, this is merely a tool for people to use and come up with their own conclusions. Uh, but I think I think you know one thing we want to be able to do is is um, uh, look at this in concert with the mapping. Uh, and what I'm really you know focused on in the mapping is you know obviously um, there's there's good reasons and and uh, and and and. Uh, justifications for putting things as much as possible on the built environment, um, arguably at higher cost, but still probably folks feel that that's justified. Um, I think we might want to think about what we want to put forward once we see some of the mapping uh, and see uh, the extent to which we have um, capacity availability, availability on the built environment. Laura, just a final comment by Laura. We'll have, we might have to come back to this again, Dwayne. Uh, just yeah. running out of time. Um, so, Laura, go ahead. Yeah, thanks, Dwayne and and Steve. This is really helpful. Um, just a clarifying question on. Um, so the first two are looking at solar generally. So roof built environment and land where the last bucket is just the land based on um based on the Massachusetts data right yeah but then I did try to extrapolate that to the entirety of solar land and not land 
with this th this this factor here. So okay. to, in order to put them all compare apples to apples across all three methods. Okay. And so all of these are for land and for any solar capacity. And then the mapping, as you said, will help us determine how much of it we could meet on built environment versus green brownfield land versus greenfield land or something like that. Exactly. And to the extent that, you know, Amherst can say, oh, we have enough capacity and wherewithal to put it, put, you know, a, a, a good chunk of this on our built environment. I think then we can ar argue that we don't need to put it as much on the land um, because we've we've done due diligence to get it as much on the built environment, perhaps more so than the state was projecting on average across the state um, uh, under this under the, their scenarios. Hey, hey, Dwayne, let's come back to this topic if we have time today after the education series. Yeah, no, um, I, yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Stephanie. If you want to go. I, Sure. Um, so I just wanted to very quickly um, look at the community survey questions and I can just go through this really quick and you don't actually even have to give me any responses to this right now. Um, I just want to go over it quickly and then you can send me any additional comments. So this document was put together by the consultant uh, GCA after having talked to um, ECAC solar bylaw working group, and then also the um, department heads. So um, I'm gonna just skip down to, this is just a general introduction of why they wanna do the survey and what the survey is hoping to achieve, but then um, just some of the questions and I'll just go over some questions about general solar attitudes. Um, there were some questions about commercial solar development. So trying to sort of get to how people feel about uh, solar development, potentially near properties um, and within the community, where they'd like to see it, um, where they think it would be located best. Um, and they're asking people to sort of rank where they'd like to see these developments occur. Um, and then- Did everyone get a chance to look at it? Okay, no, okay, go ahead, sorry, Stephanie. We all have it, Stephanie emailed You all it. have it, yep, you all have right. it. So I'm just quickly going through sort of, yeah. you know, in general for also the public's sake, you know, that these are sort of what we're working on right now. Um, this is, uh, you know, questions that are pertaining specifically to the municipal development of solar um, and how the public would like to sort of weigh in on that. I will say myself, I just wanna flag this question number two. I think shouldn't even be a question because I think it's absolutely um, diversity, equity, and inclusion is, you know, absolutely a 10, you know, so I don't even think that question should be in there. So I just want to say for your sake that that's going to be my response to the consultant and I'm going to ask them to take this question out because I think it's a given that we are going to, I think somehow they need to state that somewhere that it's going to be a priority. Um, so let's see. Um, and then how people can get involved um, in solar development if they're interested. And then for residential small scale development, just why people have or haven't been able to install solar, um, you know, what are the reasons that they, they see as barriers to their potentially um, putting solar on their property? Um, so Stephanie, my, my comment, I had the same comment on IDE, but on this one specifically, this should be a multiple choice question, the first one instead of just having them pick one one answer. Okay. Well, can you, um, yeah, so if people could just, um, I can make a note, Vasu, but rather than having people give me your feedback now, if people could just shoot me a really quick email, just with a few points, if you okay. have any, if there, are, if there are comments that you have or edits that you'd like to see, just get that to me. And then I'm gonna compile, um, I'm gonna compile the responses from both the ECAC and the Solar Bylaw Working Group and put those together. Um, and Stephanie, you needed by when? Well, ideally, so the, the Solar Bylaw Working Group has a meeting on the 16th. So if okay. I could get your responses before then so that I could actually share your responses to this so that they'll be seeing you know, this list plus your potential edits, that would be great. Okay. Uh, sorry, I didn't uh, Steve, final comments? 
Yeah, I have a question. Is, Stephanie, is there going to be any sort of an introduction that, that introduces survey respondents to the Climate Action Plan of Amherst and the state that puts this in context? Oh, yeah, there'll be, yeah, there'll be that. This right now, we're not focusing on process right now, literally just the questions that were for the survey. There's going to be, we're going to have a very in-depth um, involved process. And there's also questions in there that actually bring it back to the CARP. It does tie into the CARP. And if you just look at the survey, you'll, I think your question is answered if you look at the survey. And well, you look I, at the intro. It, it, no, it's not, because I've looked at the survey really oh, carefully. Okay. And the, 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 a lot of the questions just, they don't have a context. And my feeling was like, solar is kind of like taxes, you know, we'd rather not have it. But when there's a reason for having it, then we can accept it. And the reason for having solar is not expressed in the questions on this document. But, so again, but, but if it's going to be presented elsewhere or, or added to the survey before it goes out, that's that that's great. I believe it will be. But again, can you just give me these comments? Yeah. Like if you could all send me your comments, because then I can direct the consultant to, you know, I, I know that we've discussed that piece, I, Steve. That's why I sort of responded that way. But I think if you want to specifically see it on this actual survey as part of that introduction, and you maybe even have some specific language that you want to suggest, go for it. Just let me know. I mean, I, you don't have to spend a whole lot of time. I just, you know, it would be helpful. I will do that. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Stephanie. I'll turn it over to Lori to introduce CET. Okay. So, Edison. Um... I think the next thing on the agenda is Edison Dika from CET, who's going to tell us about weatherization and insulation. Um, doesn't look like we have a big turnout tonight, Edison, but I know we're all learning and our advocates for all of this stuff. So we're all quite interested in hearing what you have to say. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's. Um... Thanks for having me. Um, <laughs> can I share my screen? Please, yeah. All right. Thank you for joining. You're welcome. Stephanie, are there any members of the public that are out there, or is it zero? No, we don't have any attendees. Yeah, uh, a, little, a little puzzling, and I'm thinking that maybe it's just the time of year. People are getting busy with holiday stuff. Maybe, um, although you would think it's the time of year, it's getting cold. <laughs> but it's the holiday season. I think you should go back to your first point. <laughs> I, I had one person who said they were going to attend, so I guess keep an eye on the. Yeah, people will probably start showing up. Can you all see my screen yet or no? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. How about now? Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Yes, now we can see it. it looks great. Great. Uh, so thanks for having me. My name is Saida Sindika, uh, and I work for the Center for Eco Technology. Um, I've, I attended um, UMass Amherst um, for my education and um, have been in the energy auditing um, sector for over 10 years now. So I do hold um, Amherst in my heart dearly since I uh, was there for a couple of years attending school. Um, so see a little bit about CET and who we are. Um, CET works with partners throughout the country to address climate change by um, transforming the way we live and work uh, for a better community, economy, and environment. Um, so for more than about 30, I mean 40 years now, uh, our innovative nonprofit organization has offered practical solutions to save money, increase the health and comfort of our homes, and help businesses perform better. Um, we like to say that we make uh, green make sense so today I'll be um, talking about the home as a system um, and also how a home energy assessment, the, basically the home energy assessment process and also some DIY weatherization uh, and also how the massive program could kind of tie it all, all in and help um, homeowners with, uh, and also renters uh, with weatherizing their home. Uh, so CET's home energy assessments are rooted uh, in building science. Uh, so um, basically we treat the home as a system. Um, it is important to consider uh, all of the variables that go uh, into your home, um, your home's energy use. Uh, we use 
um, energy with heating, hot water, cooking, uh, cooling, um, lighting, refrigerating, refrigerators, uh, laundry, cooking. Um, yeah, I already said cooking, but um, we also lose energy, uh, which is air infiltration, air leakage, as well as through inefficient lighting and appliances. Um, finally, um, the connecting exterior layers. Uh, so these yellow lines are kind of like the building thermal boundaries. Uh, so the exterior layers that separate um, the outdoors and the indoors are areas where we want to uh, look at in terms of weatherization and making sure that those are really tight and um, sealed up to stop any air infiltration or exfiltration into the home. <clears throat> Uh, so the way buildings work is there's this thing called a stack effect. Uh, so because cold air is heavier and denser, uh, it infiltrates into the home from the basement or the lower level of the home. Uh, and then it gets warmed up by the heating system. Uh, and as warm air, as well as air is warmed up, it becomes lighter. So it starts to rise up. Um, and then it basically rises up and up and up and gets lost up in the attic or the top floor of the um, building. Uh, I was explaining this concept to a homeowner the other day and she was like, oh, the chimney effect. Uh, so uh, it's basically kind of like the same idea uh, where usually when you are sitting in front of a fireplace with a chimney, they put um, a chair that kind of like wraps around that way when the um, fireplace is pulling in the air, um, you don't feel that cold air on your back. Uh, so um, it's the same idea, buildings are built the way they are, but the way they, they are built is basically any air that comes into the home has to, um, or any air that leaves the home has to be replaced. And it's normally in the winter being replaced by um, colder air. Um, and so the idea for weatherization is stopping that cycle of the stack effect uh, and um, keeping your home warmer, longer, and stopping uh, heat loss and air infiltration. So um, these arrows are basically indicating areas where uh, infiltrates and uh, exfiltrates out of the home. So the blue arrow is the cold air coming in uh, and the yellow arrow is the warm air um, or it, the warm air rising up and then getting rising up all the way up to the top floor. And then eventually it makes its way out of the building and then the cycle repeats itself. Um, so um, I was gonna make this a little engaging uh, and ask some questions. Where do you folks um, think um, air escapes out of a building? Some examples of areas in a home that uh, air might escape. I know in my house, it's around the windows. They don't seal properly and the doors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, around the light switches that are on the mm. outer walls. Mm -hmm. Maybe between the uh, house and its foundation around the rim joist. Yep. In the in the um, attic and the eaves, mm -hmm. uh, sort of where the roof touches the walls. Right. All great answers. And, uh, and when you leave the bathroom fan on. Right ventilation <laughs> um, so yeah I, I made I put some pointers up here so floors walls ceilings uh, doors and windows um, ducts plumbing fireplaces um, outlets fans vents uh, so you all nailed it <laughs> good job um, so uh, also a little bit of about ice dance um, as air leaks out of the home. So that warm air uh, rises up and then when it leaks out of the home, uh, it hits the roof and melts the ice uh, or the snow on the roof. And then it refreezes at the um, base of the roof. 
So without weatherizing, um, there's also structural damages that could occur uh, in the home. Uh, as you can see in this picture with the ice dam basically um, damaging this uh, grip pan. Um, so weatherization is important um, and I'm gonna give, go into some ideas to weatherize your home and seal it so you don't get ice jams. So the energy auditing process, um, what we do is we um, test heating systems um, and also heating and hot water systems. We also install um, instant, what we call instant savings measures, which is basically um, shower heads, aerators, programmable thermostats, um, and um, power strips. And then we send out a, or come up with a report. Uh, it's a very comprehensive report that outlines everything that we are recommending um, you do to improve your home. Um, so some of the things that we do recommend and what homeowners could be eligible for uh, and this is depending on income for single family homeowners. Um, you be, there's various incentives that MassSave offers. Um, so there's low cost insulation. Uh, usually it's 75% off up to $2,000. Um, but for Berkshire gas, there's no cap. It's 75% um, uh, off total. Um, and if you are moderate income, um, the incentive becomes um, at 100%. Uh, so you won't have any out of pocket cost for the insulation. Um, air sealing is also a no cost under the MassSafe program. Um, there's also appliance rebates like washer uh, rebates, um, uh, domestic hot water rebates. There's no rebates on refrigerators, but if you have an old refrigerator that you would like to get rid of, uh, the program will pay you, um, I think, $50 to take it off your hand and recycle it. And there's a 0% interest rate heat loan that you could use um, to finance um, windows, insulation, heating system upgrades. Uh, windows also now have a rebate of $75, um, but you have to be upgrading from a single pane window to a triple pane Energy Star window. Uh, to qualify for that rebate. And for renters and landlords, um, they are also eligible for no cost insulation. Uh, so um, for renters, um, if your unit, if, you are, if for landlords, if they are insulating the entire building, insulation is, as, um, is covered 100%, so there's no out-of-pocket cost. And then for renters, if they are insulating just one unit, uh, it's also 100% covered under the program. And they also do get um, air sealing at no cost. Um, and there's also additional funding for addressing certain barriers like um, knob and tube. Uh, so if during the assessment, they find that there's a um, knob and tube wiring in your home, which is an old type of wiring uh, that could potentially cause fire, um, the program does give a, a grant of $5,000 to uh, remediate that before installation is done. Uh, and uh, as I go along, if you have any questions, you could raise your hand. I, I don't think I can see folks that have hands raised. So um, you could raise I'll take care of it. speak up. I'll, I'll take care of it. Yeah. I have a quick question. Ahead. Yeah, I have a quick question on this slide. Um, can renters actually call uh, MassSave themselves and get insulation put in without the landlord's permission, or do they need mm -hmm. to call the landlord? They need to call. So the landlord has to be involved. Um, they could get a free energy, renters could get a free energy assessment, but if insulation is recommended and needs to proceed, um, the landlord will have to be involved. So it's, it's better to have the landlord involved earlier on in the process than later. Um, but yeah, uh, they could, renters could call. It's just that if insulation work has to be done, um, the landlord has to be involved. Okay, thanks. But the incentives do still apply. Um, 
So for the landlord, it's all at no cost to them. And same thing for the renter. So uh, I don't see why they wouldn't want to um, take advantage of the program that way. Right, thanks. Yeah. So this year is the number to call. Um, the basic, basically to schedule your energy assessment. Um, one eight six is five two seven seven two eight three, and um, anyone um that answers that phone will be able to help you and uh, schedule an assessment. Uh, and also see if you go on the um uh, CET website, you could um schedule an assessment um for your you could schedule an assessment through uh, CET's website. And for municipal um, programs, like uh, I know South Hartley is a municipal municipality. Um, they also have a program uh, where you could contact them. Um, again, you could go on the CET website or email CET at CETonline.org um, or call us to schedule um, an assessment for municipalities. And also for low income communities, um, there's a weatherization assistance program. Uh, so you could reach out to your local community action um, or um, the community action Pioneer Valley is a local one, Valley Opportunity Council, and also Berkshire Community Action uh, all, and Springfield Partners for Community Action um, are all available to help low income um, um, customers to participate in the program. And um, for folks in the in that community, they are able to basically get all the weatherization at no cost um, to them also. Um, they are also sometimes even able to get new heating systems at no cost. Uh, so um, anyone on, in, in that community could take advantage of the program as well. Uh, question, do you create any promotional campaigns or awareness? I'm sorry, promotional campaigns or awareness. Um, for them, no, we do not. Massive actually does um, most of the marketing. Um, so most customers come to uh, to us through Massive, and um, um, webinars, webinars like this also help us get um customers. But Massive is a program that is well known in Massachusetts. So. Uh, even folks that are in municipal communities start out sometimes with mass safe and then find out that um, mass safe can save them and they find out about the municipal program through um, contacting the mass safe uh, hotline. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm going to go over some um, DIY weatherization things that um, folks could do themselves to. Um, weatherize your home. Um, safety first, uh, it's always um, good to um, make sure that you have proper eyewear and gloves on um, if you are going to do any weatherization work yourself. Um, and it's also good to uh, have adequate ventilation, especially if you are applying spray foam insulation. Um, and we recommend um, some, some tools that we do recommend um, to do this DIY projects is um, using a measuring tape, utility knife, caulking gun, um, a drill or a screwdriver. So some things that folks could do themselves is installing weather stripping. I mean, yeah, door sweeps and weather stripping. stripping. Um, you could uh, buy the um, door sweep Cut, measure the door um, at the bottom and cut it to fit, and then drill um, the weather stripping at the bottom of the door. Um, so adding a door sweep um, to the interior of a door will cut heat loss and drafts around the floor. Um, and it's good to not have it too tight to the bottom of the doors, that way um, the door will be able to um, swing uh, open and close freely. Another thing that could be done is foam gaskets, uh, which could be installed in um, behind outlets. Um, these help reduce drafts. Um, 
to do so. Um, and also stop egg um, infiltration into the home. And V seal weather scraping um, uh, installed around the uh, frame uh, of the door. Um, that way, when you close the door, it uh, kind of has a good uh, seal around the door to stop any uh, air infiltration and draft through the door. Um, the way to install it, um, you have to measure and cut um, at an angle with a knife or scissor, then fold the strip into a V, uh, remove the paper backing and attach the strip onto the door or window. Uh, after installing the V seal, um, you want to test the door uh, to make sure it's in, um, it isn't too tight. Um, some cracking and uh, of the strip may be heard, but uh, that's normal. Uh, it's just, uh, it might happen a couple of times to have the seal broken into. And uh, caulking, uh, caulking can neatly and effectively create a permanent seal around gaps in windows, um, uh, window frames and other areas uh, where it um, is um, able to infiltrate. Uh, so to apply caulking, uh, you wanna cut the tip of the um, tube of the cork uh, at an angle and place it in a caulking gun, pull the trigger uh, to release uh, a bead of cork and lay the cork down at an angle to fill the gap. Um, you could uh, kind of like uh, knitting up the cork with your finger um, after you apply it. Another good option um, if folks don't wanna use this type of caulking is uh, the rope cork uh, or maltite. Uh, and it's a similar product that seals gaps really well. Uh, spray foam, um, as you can see, it's been applied around a, um, a PVC pipe. Um, and like caulk, spray foam is effective at sealing gaps in the envelope of the home uh, where air infiltration occurs. Uh, unlike caulk, it's harder to control and it's um, the spray foam is harder to control. Uh, so it's best to use um, the spray foam in basements or around pipes um, instead of in a, around in um, windows in your living space. And uh, insulation. Um, so once you've air sealed uh, your home, the next step is to make sure that you have adequate um, insulation. Uh, so while air sealing eliminates air infiltration and leakage, insulation slows uh, heat loss through the building materials in your home. Uh, so attics, walls, floors, uh, heating pipes, and ducts should be uh, considered should all be considered for added insulation. Uh, and the um, massive recommends now uh, R49 in an attic, uh, which is about 15 inches in the attic. Um, and around basement uh, rim joists, um, you could just install six inch fiberglass bats around the basement rim joist. Um, walls are a little bit tricky because they are in, uh, considered an enclosed cavity. Um, so usually walls are done by professionals, but the way they insulate walls is to pull up, pull up the siding from the exterior, drill holes, and blow the insulation or dense back the insulation into the wall cavity. So it's usually a two by four wall or two by six. Uh, and the goal is basically to fill the entire wall cavity uh, with insulation. And um, another thing that could be done is pipe insulation. So hydronic pipes, uh, which are the copper pipes that um, baseboard uh, heating systems have or um, the domestic hot water pipes could be uh, wrapped with insulation. Uh, also steam pipes uh, could also be insulated. Um, so um, basically all you have to do um, is get the um, pipe wrap insulation and then um, wrap it around the um, pipe as is shown here. You could actually see the white um, 
stuff here is actually steam pipes that are wrapped with um, fiberglass. Uh, so that's pipe wrap insulation. And um, faucet aerators are stuff that we install as part of the energy assessment. But um, if folks are not getting the energy assessment, they could buy a low flow aerator themselves and install it in their faucets, underneath their faucets to save on um, their gas or oil um, water heating. And LED light bulbs um, are also stuff that we give out during the energy assessment. Um, but again, um, folks could go out and buy LED light bulbs themselves um, these days and install. Um, and um, any questions? That was my last, yeah, any questions for the mass save weatherization program and weatherization in general. Steve. Yeah, thanks, Edison. Um, I, I in the past I've used the more tight around doors, like in the winter time, and we just seal them up for the season. Lately, I though I got a seal and peel removable caulk that is supposedly you squeeze it on like regular caulk, but you can remove it have you any experience with that and do you know if i'm going to have any problems removing it in the springtime i i don't personally have any okay. experience um with it um one thing that i have heard happens with some types of caulking is that they end up hardening and drying up and kind of cracking uh, uh, but i'm i'm not sure about that specific kind that you mentioned all right, thank you. You're welcome. Hey, Stephanie, let's also open it up to the public for any questions. We have one. Public. Sure. So, Elizabeth, do you have any questions that you'd like to ask Edison? If you electronically raise your hand, then I can unmute you. Or any other questions from ECAC? I can ask a, a question that's been on my mind. Um, so recently I looked into getting storms from my old crank out windows. Um, it turns out glass storms have gone up in price enormously. And there's a slightly cheaper option, which is a film in a frame. It's a film storm with foam around the outside. And it strikes me that there's probably no disadvantage to that. Is there any disadvantage to using a storm made of thin vinyl film as opposed to a glass storm? No, I'm, I mean, a glass storm is a bit more rigid. Uh, and I know folks use um, plastic on their windows to stop drafts. Uh, so the, the film will be serving that same purpose. Um, but certainly a glass um, storm is um, much more rigid and will um, will serve a better purpose. In, in terms of U values, I think, yeah, a glass storm will be better, but the frame wouldn't hurt. Uh, it's gonna, it is gonna stop, um, stop drafts. Stop drafts, yeah. Yeah. Edison, what would you recommend for low-income communities here? Um, if we create an awareness campaign, what should be their approach? Contact Mass Save first. How are they getting discounts? Uh, explain that process, please. Yeah. So for low income, uh, sorry, sorry. For, yeah, for low income community, they um, Mass Save doesn't serve um, the low income community, but they go through the community action program. Um, and um, that was in the slide I shared. So the way they could participate is by calling any one of these um, community action programs, um, depending on where they live. Each, each action program serves uh, a specific area or geographical area. Uh, so they'll call them and then ask for an energy assessment um, and, everything under 
this program is at no cost to them. So the energy audit, um, the installation work, air sealing, uh, sometimes they are able to get even heating uh, systems repaired uh, at no cost to them and also even replaced. Uh, I've had some, some folks that have had uh, heat pumps installed for them at no cost. Um, so this program is basically geared towards um, the low income community and they just will have to call any one of these. Uh, I think Greenfield has um, Pioneer Valley Community Action. Yeah, I think Greenfield is part of the Pioneer Valley Community Action. So uh, all of these communities and programs are available for the low income community and they could participate um, just by calling and um, getting an energy audit as a first step. Okay, so that's, thank you for that. So for low-income community, first step would be to call these people. For everybody else, they'll go through massive, Correct. they'll come and do an energy assessment and make recommendations for you to install. Right. Okay. Um, and if folks don't know whether they are on low income or not, um, they could look on their utility bill. Um, usually, uh, National Grid and Eversource will show um, if they are rich, it's based on the rate code. So if their rate code is income eligible, um, then they qualify for low income. And in that case, they could call their local community action program. Thank you, Steve. And, yeah, and they could still also call MassSave and MassSave will look at their utility bill or check if they are and uh, redirect them. Got Sorry, it. Steve. Great, um, yeah, could you, say a little bit more about what a renter might expect when they call for a mass save audit what what sort of things can they get done if they don't have permission from the landlord so they could get the energy assessment done um so they'll get the no cost energy assessment uh, along with all the instant savings measures that come with it um like uh, faucet aerator shower heads um power strips, uh, programmable thermostats or Wi-Fi thermostats. Um, although the Wi-Fi thermostats um, might be tricky if their landlord is um, really picky about what the tenants install or someone touching the heating system. Um, but yeah, they could get the uh, um, assessment done. And sometimes we found that if the landlord is not involved, uh, one thing that we do um, at, as part of the energy assessment is test the heating system. And usually heating systems are located in a basement and some tenants don't have, uh, or renters don't have access to the basement. So uh, we do the assessment without testing the heating system. But if weatherization needs to be done, then uh, we we'll have to go back and do a compassion safety test um, to ensure that all the heating systems are working uh, well and in good um, condition before weatherization could be done. Okay, let me also ask the question, if I'm a landlord, say it's a small two-family rental house, what would I expect from a mass save inspection and would it involve going through the tenant's apartment? Yes. So as a landlord, you have to notify your renters um, that you are getting an energy assessment done because we do need to enter uh, the units, um, take measurements and gather information that is needed. Um, so you will have to let your tenants know um, the time and that we are, will be arriving. Uh, so to give us access into their units uh, to perform the energy assessment. I also know some folks um, wanna get heat pumps um, and the criteria to get heat pumps is basically you have to have your home weatherized first before um, you get a heat pump rebate. Um, so uh, for, uh, the heat pump rebate is $10,000 um, up to $10,000 depending on if you do a whole home heat pump or a partial home. So uh, for the whole home uh, rebate, if you wanna get the full $10,000 rebate, uh, you have to have weatherization done first before um, installing the heat pump. 
but for the partial home weatherization is not required. And Edison, based on your experience, what town has been successful in creating awareness, ensuring that homes are weatherized? And what did they do? It's, it's tough to say um, because I the massive program is broad and there's so many different companies. So I only have visibility into some the area, the geographical areas that I work. But I know uh, Framingham um, has um, some some I've heard of some towns that have had partnership with MassSafe. And so MassSafe marketed um, those towns and said, um, if you do get a, a, a home energy assessment uh, through the MassSafe program, maybe they get extra some extra incentives on um, certain things. Um, so it's um, it's those towns that have been successful in getting a bigger participation um, partnered with MassSave and then MassSave um, marketed um, using their resources to um, um, get folks to participate. Interesting, thank you. Mm -hmm. and, and Stephanie, that's something that we don't currently partner closely, right, with MassSave? Um, uh, um I, that's a hard question to answer because I feel like in the past we've done lots and lots of um, outreach uh, around the Mass Save program. Um, it's been less so, I think, recently, but um, I think when we start doing this heat pump program, and we'll actually hopefully be working closely with CET, so that will be very much um, We'll be very much promoting the Mass Save program as part of that effort. Yeah. Okay. I'm really looking forward to that. <laughs> it waxes and wanes, you know. Yeah. We've certainly promoted it for a long time, depending on various projects that we've done. Yeah, and I know um, some towns that did the part. So individual towns are able to do their own outreach, um, but the partnership is basically them. Um, promoting a certain um, I, um, energy efficient uh, measure uh, and um, having massive market that for them. So if you, the town has enough um, money to put towards maybe giving additional incentives to homeowners, uh, massive will partner with that town and market that additional incentive. Laura, I know you had your hand raised. You have a question. My question was similar to Steve, so I think it was answered. Oh, okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Edison, thank you again. And Lori, I don't know if you have anything to say here. Um, closing well, comments. Thank you. Just wanted to thank you very much, Edison, for showing up today. I think we've all learned quite a bit. So. Um, thank you. You're very welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I appreciate thank your time. You. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Trying to see how to stop. <laughs> okay. Feel free to stay on if you want, or uh, if you want to drop, that's fine too. Thank you. All right, we have uh, 22 minutes. Dwayne, do we want to go back to the conversation we were having on solar? Yeah, yep, happy to do so um, and get some more feedback and direction from the group. Um, if it's helpful to bring this, bring the um, spreadsheet up again, I'm happy to do that. Steve, you already have a question. Yeah, I, I guess I have a raise a question uh, for perhaps discussion. The results here, Dwayne, are in megawatts. And I think many people aren't going to be able to sort of grasp what that means and, and people might want to know will probably want to know like okay well how much is that in acres so do you foresee having a being able to convert that result from megawatts into acres or dollars use? yeah i mean i i i i, I was thinking about that steve because you brought that up before um and i guess i was reluctant to do that 
uh, because um, um, we don't want to, I don't particularly want to suggest that this has to go on the ground uh, and take up acreage. Um, and um, that um, I do understand that people know what an acre is more so than a megawatt, uh, but, uh, but um, I, I was a little bit concerned about, you know, suggesting that ECAC is, it, it, or making the um, in, uh, suggestion, I guess, that ECAC was assuming that this all had to be on, on, the, on the ground or ground mounted. Um, so I, I, you know, may, maybe, it, maybe it comes when we see the assess uh, the, the solar uh, uh, resource assessment tool and the and the mapping to see okay now we you know we have x number of megawatts that seem you know not just technically but but reasonably uh, uh, capable on on the built environment uh, and then we can say okay well if we if we really work hard to build that out any remainder has to be on the ground and that much capacity would take up this much additional acreage. Um, so that was sort of my thought was not to suggest um, and, and, and con concern people or not that, that um, we were suggesting this all should be on the ground. That, that, that's good. And I, I, I agree with that. Um, just point out that method three is using the Commonwealth projected ground mount solar. Yeah. And so that, that, 35 to 100,000 or the 60,000 in particular, that is explicitly ground mount, assuming maximal coverage of rooftops and parking lots um, in there. So that that one is a bit more in acres and you, you've converted it from acres back to yeah. megawatts and clever people will see the conversion there so they can always convert megawatts back to right. acres if they choose to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dwayne, if you want to pull up that spreadsheet, that would yeah, be great. Yeah. Stella, mm -hmm. Laura, and, and then Lori. Oh, just Stella and Laura. Is, I wonder if um, just a different measurement less implies ground versus uh, not ground. Because I, for example, like square footage, I don't think really suggests, like, I imagine square footage would be a very big number. So maybe it would be like more alarming. but. <laughs> I don't think it I don't think it has that like square footage or square yardage. I think like people yeah. know what their like roof square footage is. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I could also we could also say, okay, you know, this number of megawatts would imply um X number of would be equivalent to X number of of, of um residential roof projects, uh, which would be a pretty enormous number of roof uh, of uh residential roofs. Uh, or you know x number of um, acres of land, um, but yeah, or or you know square feet. I, I, um, I guess that that becomes then you know when we talk about square feet, then we have to think about okay, how many me megawatts or watts per square foot is the right um, uh, distribution or or spacing out of these arrays. Um, uh so it's all uh, yeah so we can think about those yeah and i think there's also a government website that converts wattage to phones that are required to charge or acres it just makes it simpler <laughs> for people to understand i'll i'll see if i can find it and i there's like images of you know how many cars per year that yeah. i never liked that <laughs> i never liked those conversions because uh, you know what's a typical house is that you know? Is it a U.S. typical house or Massachusetts? And it's different in Boston than here. Um, every car is different. I don't know what you know people, but and you know, a car that doesn't drive anywhere or drives very little doesn't really. Um, I guess it's all averaged out, but it's I, I never liked those conversions yeah. too much. But good, I got you. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. So I don't know. Yeah. Laura and Jesse. Yeah, I was going to say something similar to Stella that maybe like square footage would be a more neutral terminology than acreage. But um, I do like the idea of kind of like taking this and houses may be hard, but maybe we say like an average big box store, like if we were going to use a roof of an average big or an average big box store is X square footage roofage. So um, but I think, Dwayne, I I agree with your approach that um we should kind of keep this 
at maybe it makes sense to keep this at a more um, technical level until we get the mapping. And then we can really start to think through how it all fits together before figuring out how to communicate our, I agree with Steve. I think when, when ECAC goes to communicate whatever ECAC wants to communicate on this, I think we need to be aware that not everybody's going to understand what megawatts are. I, I understand what megawatts are, but I still, it's a struggle for me to like scale it still. Um, so I, I think we should definitely think about that, but I, I like the idea of focusing in on combining these two elements, because I do think understanding where we do have potential for non land-based systems is going to be an important part of the conversation um, in town. Yeah. I mean, the other thing that I was going to add um, somewhere in the whole story is recognizing the 20 or so, don't quote me on that, megawatts that is already installed in, Mass in uh, Amherst. Um, just to put that in context too, that we're not starting from scratch um, and that, you know, what people see now is about, I, I won't say 20, but I think it might be about 20 megawatts. I think that includes Hickory Ridge, which is in the pipeline. Um, uh, and and uh, um, so to give some context along those lines. Uh, so I was going to add some information about about what's already installed or or to be installed in Amherst. And, so, and some sense of the distribution. I mean, it you know, turns out we have, you know, a, a decent start of the megawatts. Um, and there's, uh, but again, as with the state, um, there's many, many residential projects, but the 90% of the capacity is in the larger projects. Jesse, and then Steve. Yeah, I'd just like to add a vote to the column of, I, I think there has, I, I actually feel uncomfortable just using megawatts. Oh yeah, okay. I, I really think it's important to help people to understand um, and whatever, and maybe a diversity of representations, but there, it, some way to show that I, the, con I, what are, why are we doing this if not to say, to sort of give a sense of an order of magnitude. These are order of magnitude numbers and, and and there has to be some sort of translation into to that anyone in this town who who could get some version that they could relate to. I, I just think it's yeah. really. I mean, important. I could certainly, um, you know, with with again some assumptions, um, uh, and with some very bold letter types that were that this is just for reference purposes. That you know. Uh, uh, in equivalent, you know, whatever the number numbers would be, or maybe just say, you know, 50 megawatts would be equal to, um, if it was all on rooftop, uh, all on residential rooftops, it would be, you know, these many roofs, uh, homes in Amherst that would have to have, have, uh, um, solar, uh, or, um, if it was all on, on ground, on the ground and very clear to that we're not suggesting like two or three it is, it should be. different ones. Yeah, if you include a couple of metrics, we're, we're not saying it's yeah. got to be on the ground. We're not, yeah. you know, I mean, if you're in Hadley, there are acres of roofs and parking lots, <laughs> it could be even be square miles. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, parking lots. You could use specific parking lots, even. Yeah, that people okay, can identify with. Yep. Um, Lori. Well, Steve and then Lori. Okay, sorry. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. I was I, jumping. <laughs> in, we jump around. Where you going? The so I was kind of taking over. Okay, go ahead. I wanted, I guess, to offer my opinion here in that I, uh, similar to Jesse's, I think it's our job to inform the town based on our expert opinions what we're facing. Yeah. This is not what we're facing next year or 10 years from now. This is what we're facing in 2050, so almost 30 years from now. But I think we need to tell the town what we see based on our expertise in the Massachusetts roadmap and all the detailed energy studies that they have done. This is what we're going to plan for. And I think it's going to be a shocking number. And I think people need to be shocked and step back and say, OK, well, if we're going to have our commitment to being carbon neutral, then 
that's it, it's a commitment that comes with consequences and the consequences are going to be seeing more solar um and i think people need to begin to prepare for that so i think you know when when we get down to it i'll i'll argue again that i think we need to make this quite explicit and say um this is how many acres it'll take and it, some of it can go on rooftops but amherst does not have a lot of big rooftops and nor do we have a lot of big parking lots and a good chunk of what we come up with here is going to have to go on the land um and that's that's a consequence of our commitment to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions and i think we need to be clear that's our expert opinion and acknowledge that other people might have different opinions but it's not our job to represent the public of amherst our job is to pro provide our expert opinion as a rec as as recommendation or as information to the town council and to the town manager that's our role here so that's that'll be my opinion i'll, I'll let go of that again in yeah. the future uh, laurie if i can jump in on the same topic um and quickly share my screen i this is something that um i had uh, can you see my webs this website here this is uh, the EPA website, and you can plug in kilowatt hours, and then it converts to vehicles, gasoline burned, um, and then it also talks about landfill and LEDs and trees. So pick your poison, I guess. Dwayne, I can send this over to everybody, and you can figure out what how you want to approach this. Another, just another suggestion. So. Yeah, it is a little bit different. We're talking about megawatts, not megawatt hours. Yeah, yeah, I know. Correct. So, yeah. Um, so it is a bit yeah. different, but yeah, I, yeah. I, um, I, I got that. Yeah. Laurie and Andre. Uh, okay, a couple of things. One is, I think it's really important to emphasize that we're pretty far along already, and that maybe even Dwayne, you might consider subtracting the existing or, or already in progress megawatts from the projections to make it clear that we've already made some progress, some significant progress. That mm -hmm. would lessen the shock a bit. I also, yeah, I don't think it really needs to be shocking if it's presented that way. And, uh, you know, if people remember that this is over, over a few, we have a few years to, to do this. The other thing, though, that I wanted to bring up, we talked about this a little bit just as we were chatting before the before the webinar, before the today's meeting began, um, the prices for putting solar panels on rooftops, I'm looking at two quotes for 15 kilowatts, a uh, 15 kilowatt system for uh, $67,000 <laughs> or a, uh, a a 23 kilowatt system for 77,000. <laughs> which is so far out of affordable for almost everybody I know, um, any you know, homeowner in Amherst, even with the 30% rebates that are coming, um, you have to wonder how that would ever work. So I um, just wanna make sure that somehow in this discussion, the idea of the really high expense of rooftop solar comes through. Um, big box stores are different. We don't have any big box stores in Amherst though, but we do have Municipal buildings and schools and and things that might make good platforms for solar. A, a fifteen kW system would be it, re, it would require a very large roof. That would be a very big house. Not a uh, very big house. And well, I mean, my system's a little over seven, and it provides more than enough I need for my family of four in my house. Yeah, I don't, I'd be I don't surprised have... if fifteen most. They cap most of the net metering incentives and everything at 10 kW. 15. I think that's been expanded now. Oh, it's oh, been, good. Must be, it must have been expanded because that's what I have sitting in my Energy Sage inbox. And, wow. It's and, a pretty uh, big system, solar. though. Yeah, yeah, 15 kW would be the, about the largest you see on a residence. Yeah. Okay, right. so that means I've, uh, even a 5 kW system would be a meaningful um, yeah. system for yeah. most if, houses. If you don't have trees all around like my house. If you have trees, then maybe your house isn't. Yeah, it isn't a good candidate, but there are also a lot of houses in Amherst that have trees all around. So. Well, so, I mean, this is, Lori, I mean, I think that you're getting to the point, right? Like, there's not, putting solar on everyone's roof is not a feasible solution to right. this problem. Yeah, so, good. we have to, I strongly support Steve's sentiment here. Like, as ECAC, we need to be strong in our convictions around what we need to do to meet our climate goals 
and what that means. We can't, it is, we are talking about 2050, which has benefits, right? We're giving ourselves time, but that also doesn't mean we can say, I mean, what I've heard folks in town say is like, well, the technology will improve and we'll just have it all on the roof. So let's not worry about ground mount right now. And that cannot be the message that ECAC is sending, right? So I think that's gonna, this is gonna be an important discussion for us to have. And yeah, we need to bring in all those variables, right? Of course, like we want as many people in town to benefit from the economic, for those who can to benefit from from the economics of of solar and and renewables. That doesn't mean everybody can. So then how can we support people that can't because they don't own their roof or they don't ha they have trees or whatever the situation might be. And it may mean more community-based solar which may need to be on land. So like these are the things that we are going to need to be coming out strong on um as ECAC, and to Steve's point, like we should anticipate what the community members and those who have been against this type of solar might think, but we shouldn't be trying to, as ECAC, solve those problems. Now, when Dwayne, Hugh, and Stephanie get into the solar working group, that's a different scenario, right? But like, I think we can bring out a strong statement. Um, and I think your data, Dwayne, is really going to help us do that in a meaningful way. There is one other thing I want to throw out there, which is the factor of two increase in electric usage has always struck me as low. I know that if you just calculate, you know, how much heat you use, if you're using fossil fuel, it's going to be typically two or three times the amount of power you're already using in electricity, if not more. Um, so, I mean, I personally have a factor of five there between pre-electrification and post-electrification, mm -hmm. right? So I wonder if that factor of two is realistic. That's something that we can't address here, but I'm just throwing that out there. It's an interesting point. I'll look into that. I mean, do keep in mind with at least with the heat pumps, you're getting, you know, two and a half, three units of heat for right. the, for each kilowatt hour that you use. Yes. Uh, right. and, then, and electric vehicles yeah. are inherently more efficient. Yeah, it's more like two, two and a half averaged over the year. Um, but yeah, it, it's there's a factor yeah. of two in there, but it's still it's still a lot more. If you add an electric vehicle and an electric uh you know, um, water, water pump and, and you change your stove to electric and all that sort of thing. It's, it's, it's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And we're running out of time. So I'll, we'll quickly wrap up with Andra and Stephanie. Um, yeah, I, I just wanted to question how much, um, Massachusetts is really going to be relying on solar. Um, I, I thought 25% was the like limit that anyone imagined us going. I thought it was a lot lower, frankly. Um not not uh according to their their roadmap. Really? Um and um you know keep in mind I mean that's one the one that we have well that and offshore wind is what we have control over. Um and and um they work very well complementing each other. And and high, and if we don't get the hydro, it's going to be it's going to be a lot more or 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 bring on the nuke nuke plants, um, mm -hmm. more so. Um, but yeah, Jesse, uh, I just I you know I think we've all seen a lot of contentious issues in this town divide people, um, in general all the time, uh, I do, and things and I think just want to like. If as best we can set the tone of being open-minded and collaborative with all the points of view, mm -hmm. not everyone's going to agree. And really taking that that mindset of of really opening and trying to find ways to create dialogue and find out early and not not have an argument show up, you know, right before a big project goes to permitting that kind of thing. So I'm just going to plant that seed of like good positive dialogue about this topic because I think it's I think it has the potential to be divisive and 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 if we really set that intent to not be divisive and to really it's just in our hearts really I think this all of these projects will have more potential success so I just want to throw that out non-scientific comment out there oh, yeah absolutely yeah thanks Jason. Stephanie 
Um, so I, I kind of want to get back a little bit to what Steve and Laura said, and also to a point that I keep coming back to. In that you are all appointed by the town manager, you are advisory to the town manager. I feel like there has been some connection with the council that has blurred lines a little bit. And I think what the town manager is looking for is your recommendation with the expertise that you all have as to what he should be presenting to the council as to what the town's goals are. And so I think that knowing that that's kind of the pathway, I think some of this controversy is not really, it shouldn't really be be necessarily engaged with with this body in that you are all trying to take a very scientific expert look at this issue and deliver your recommendations to the town manager. I think some of those other controversial um, that other controversial dialogue will happen and it may happen at a different level. So I'm just putting that out to you that I think just for clarification that, you know, you all are recommending this to the town manager. That's ultimately, and he even commented to me, commented to me recently that he really appreciates um, the advice that he gets from this committee. So I just wanted to share that with you and to remind you that that's kind of a pathway and should really be a focus for you. Right. And I'll just maybe follow that. I know we're a little bit over time, but I mean, I don't really see recommendations coming out until this is put together with the resource assessment, um, because um, uh, because you know I don't think we want to see what the resource assessment looks like in in uh, for the town, um, uh, both in terms of the built environment and and there's a lot of land in Amherst. It's not appropriate for solar that we've started to look at with GCA because of various different different issues, and so you know the 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 you know whether how this range of solar fits into Amherst, I think we have to wait and see to some extent uh, before making sort of a recommendation if we're going to recommend sort of a certain target of solar that that should be accommodated in, in Amherst by a certain date, uh, because it may turn out to be that we just for various quirks of our town, we don't have the geography for it, the built environment or the geography. And we do have to work with the likes of Hadley and and share some of their roof, roof space, uh, for example, or farm space if it's dual use, uh, given given their probably, you know, more abundant land and less load. Uh, to, well, they probably have decent load because of all the commercial uh, enterprise there. So, because uh, I think that's going to be some of the um, thoughts from the public uh in terms of, of a more how this fits into to a regional approach steve final, final comment and then you okay can. i see these from this spreadsheet and this work that we've done is not a recommendation for how much the town should have but really just some order of magnitude estimates of what the town might consider given the massachusetts plan um, yeah. So not a recommendation for how much the town should develop, not at all. But here's if we translate what the, town, the 2050 roadmap predicts we'll need, this is a prediction of what Amherst would need. And I think that gives background then to a future recommendation, as Dwayne said, combined with the, um, the resource assessment. But I think getting a number out there just to let people know what the ballpark amount is likely to be uh, is really important. So thank you. Thank you. And thanks, Dwayne. Um, do we want to have the meeting in two weeks before I forget? Is everybody going to be available? Yeah, I'm not. Yeah. I'm having a Hanukkah party that night. <laughs> Is there anyone else who knows for sure they won't be able to attend on the 21st? Well, let me ask this. Should we take a break, a pause, and just meet in January? We've done a lot of work in this year. Should we, I mean, do we have any pressing needs, actions? I'm personally, more likely, I'm personally more likely to be gone in January than I am on December 21st. I don't mind continuing on next time, but happy to take a break too, either way. But do we have any pressing actions, discussions for next week? Well, in two weeks. My recommendation is we'll take a break. Um, 
I second your recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's do that. Let's uh, meet on the 4th of January. Will that work? I think our, at least on my calendar, a recurring meeting has expired at the end of the year, but um, I, it, in my mind, it probably makes sense to just keep it going on the, every other Wednesday. Yeah. Stephanie, it's only, she, yeah, it okay. only lets me schedule so far, so I can probably start adding those other dates. So I'll just continue to do every two weeks. So we'll keep it to the fourth. Um, might, yeah, we'll, we'll just keep it to the fourth. If we can get the okay. agenda done sooner than later, I'll have to post it way in advance. Okay, any closing comments? Thank you, Vasu. Have a great yeah. holiday and new year. Yeah, yeah. Everybody. Happy new year, yeah. everyone. Relax. Happy holidays, everybody. Holiday. Yeah, relax and recharge. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. Sorry. Take care, everybody. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.